there's someone in our community that killed a child. A child that everybody loved and knew. A young girl's life is cut short. I felt like I had nothing left to live for. She was my baby. And a peaceful town is rocked. These things don't happen here. On the wall in his garage, he had a list of all the names of the little girls in the trailer park that they were living in. In this small town, a killer is hiding in plain sight. You knew the man. Yes. At least I thought he did. All these inconsistencies, the red flags, the lies, you can't just let it go. They have to be addressed. Lives are turned upside down. I lost everything. Lost everything I had. Who can you trust anymore? I'm Tony Harris. In my 30 years as an investigative reporter, I've learned that every crime reveals a world of trouble. A family, a neighbor, an entire town changed forever. Come with me to the scene of the crime. Known as the seed corn capital of the world, Constantine, Michigan is home to just 2,000 people. Everyone knows everyone, and they look out for one another. But the murder of 11-year-old Jody Parrick and the search for her killer changed all that. Pitting neighbor against neighbor, and unraveling nearly two centuries of trust. I'm here to revisit these events and see for myself how a small town can turn on itself and be forever changed in the face of tragedy. The body of missing 11-year-old Jody Perry. Jody's body was found in the township cemetery hours after she left home to go on a bike ride with her friends and never return. She was born on Labor Day, September 2nd, 1996. And she weighed six pounds, 13 and three quarter ounces. And she was 19 and a half inches long. She didn't really cry when she was born, but she was healthy and beautiful. And I remember thinking, when I grow up, I'm going to have a little girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. And I'm going to name her Jody. What kind of a kid was Jody? She was a tomboy and a princess because she had her two older brothers. So she grew up playing with boys. And she still wanted to paint her nails and do her hair and look all cute but she liked to fish and swim and ride bikes, play football. She asked me if she could join the football team at school. I'm Come like, on, really? Yeah, I was like, no, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me about November 8th, 2007. It was nice out that day. It wasn't cold, it wasn't hot. It was a regular school day. The kids went to school, and then after school, they came home. That afternoon unfolds like any other in Constantine. Grown-ups arrive home from work and start dinner, while children ride their bikes, squeezing that last bit of daylight before dinner and homework. Jody asked me if she could go to her friend's house, so I let her go. It's like it, she was supposed to be grounded, but I let her go, so. When did you first become concerned about your daughter on November 8th? 
When she didn't come home at 5.30. That was the time she was supposed to be back. Right. Jody's friend lives only a few blocks away. And Jody has made that trip on her bike hundreds of times. But this afternoon, she doesn't come home. And as afternoon turns to evening, Joe starts to panic. Where did you look? Where did you search? First, I went to her friends' houses. And of course, none of them had seen her. I went to the schools, looked in the playgrounds, the parks down by the river. Constantine's chief of police, Mark Honeyset, was one of the first people to hear about Jody's disappearance. Got a call from the officer on duty. Mom was, was becoming increasingly um, panicky. And the officer himself, who, who is pretty uh, laid back, he said, I'm I'm beginning to get a bad feeling about this. Small town. If somebody knows, everybody knows. I think word got out, and we started getting phone calls from people who were saying, you know, and yeah. I'd be glad to help you look. And this place was searched, thoroughly searched? This is one of the prime places to look because it's so isolated. As darkness falls and the temperature drops, more and more Constantine residents join Jody's mom and the police in the search. For hours, cars full of neighbors drive the streets and townsfolks comb the woods, searching for some sign of the missing girl. But they find no trace. Then a reserve officer who has joined the search party suggests searching the town cemetery. Jody's mother is one of the first to get there. What happens next? So we're pulling in the cemetery. And when we turn the corner, the headlights shone on the bike. The bike was leaned up against the tombstone, and it was a silver mongoose, and the headlights shone up on it. And then we saw Jody laying on the ground. I got out of the car and it seemed like she was like a football field away and I didn't see any other tombstones except the one that she was beside. And she was laying on her side. And when I ran up to her, I grabbed her arm. Her arm was stiff already and I knew she was dead. I mean, I mean, that just confirmed it. And I just fell on the ground and I was screaming, no God, no God. I just sat on the ground and I held her until the ambulance and police got there. Joe, of course, was, was hysterical and, and inconsolable, understandably. Um, Joe's husband was there, and, and he was very emotional. I mean, everyone was just broken. Officers eventually get here, and they get an opportunity to take a look at the body. What do they see? What do they notice? Um, well, she's fully clothed. Um, and she's, she's lying kind of askew, and they noticed that on her, on both of her wrists were some, some indentations that looked like she'd been bound in some fashion. 
As forensic investigators arrive at the crime scene, grisly details emerge about what Jody endured in her last hours. There's several things that were significant. One was that there was some bruising um, on the breasts and saliva or DNA on at least one of the breasts. The marks on her wrist, that wrists, both wrists, that would uh, indicate either handcuffs or some sort of bindings. And the third was that um, she suffocated. And one of the things that appeared possible was that a, paper, a plastic bag was over her head and maybe a rubber band or something around her neck to, to cut off oxygen. The town of Constantine has never seen such a horrific crime. And as word spreads, so does a sense of terror. A child has been murdered, and a killer is on the loose. In the days ahead, one person of interest will emerge, and it is one of the town's own. A cemetery is the place where we put our dead to rest. A place where we can visit and remember them and where we hope they rest in peace. But on November 8th, 2007, the Constantine Cemetery became a crime scene. The body of 11-year-old Jody Parrott was found at the base of a tombstone, sending shockwaves through the tight-knit community. Every small town has its gathering places, and some Constantine locals have agreed to meet me at the Meeks Mill Cafe to share their memories of Constantine and of life in town and the days and weeks following Jody's murder. Tell me what life was like in Constantine, November 7th of 2000. What was life like in this town? You always saw kids out playing, kids in the park, just a really relaxed, loving community. A lot of football games, especially then. Everybody walks downtown before a game and yeah. eat somewhere at one of the local restaurants and then have to get back to the school to have the game. Or this that. is really the Friday Night Lights town. Forget about oh, what's on television. There you go. Yeah. This is really the Friday Night Lights town, right? When is the first time you got any indication that something pretty traumatic had happened in your town? The next day, yeah. the rumor started. I didn't really believe what was being said. Yeah, what was being said? What was the rumor? That there had been a child found that was murdered. And I thought, nah, there's something wrong somewhere. This child must have gotten hurt, run hit by a car or something, but not murdered. And that didn't add up for you? No, it did not. Why is that? Not in constant <laughs> Everybody knows everyone. Right. I mean, there's no strangers in this town that might have done something like this. Can't possibly be. Yeah. If it happened, someone was transient and passing through. Right. Certainly not someone from no, the community. Not at all. Everybody kept the kids a lot closer. And uh, there was no more, no one was riding their bikes around at that time or walking to school so much, not by themselves. Everybody was really keeping track of the kids. The basic character of this town changed. Yes, yes. definitely. While the shocked community mourns the loss of one of their children, the investigation into her death quickly zeroes in on a person of interest. One person, absolutely, one person stood out for us more prominently than anybody else, and, and that was uh, a reserve officer, Ray McCann. Instead of being hailed a hero for leading police to the crime scene, reserve officer Ray McCann immediately becomes a person of interest. The one spot he insisted be checked is the one spot 
where she was found. And I don't think anybody who hears that exchange automatically thinks, what a coincidence. Ray McCann is well known in the town of Constantine. He grew up there. His whole family lives there. And he's been serving the community as a football referee and as a reserve officer for years. Chief, you knew Ray. Um, you kind of signed off on him. Yeah, okay, let's bring him on. What kind of a guy was he? He was married and, and uh, had at least, I think, two children. Kind of quiet, almost came across as a little bit shy. He wasn't one who who stood out, you know, in any in any way, good or bad. Ray's suggestion that the search party check the cemetery has landed him at the top of the suspect list. After Chief Honeyset brings Ray in for questioning, the answers that he gives will keep him there. You get an opportunity to sit down and question Ray, correct? Correct. Describe that interview for me. I really had the impression that he was being deceitful with me. Part of the reason that I was interviewing him was because at least... You had a relationship with him. You knew the man. Yes. Or at least I... At least I thought I did trying to figure out where Ray had been all through the evening while ostensibly looking for Jody. He said he had gone to um, an area of town very near this building here because the officer on duty asked to meet him there. And he said he waited there for some period of time. And the officer never showed up. Well, the officer said, we never had any such conversation. I never asked him to meet me there. The story he, he gave made no sense at all. Police can't come up with a motive for the murder, but they think Ray's stories about where he was at specific times that night and what he was doing don't add up. To make an arrest, however, the investigators need hard forensic evidence. You're not happy with the answers that you're getting from Ray. There's DNA at the crime scene. And now you want Ray's DNA. You want to determine if there is a match. Correct. DNA is tested. What are the results? His DNA was not a match for the samples found on Jody's body. So there's no DNA match. Where's the case go from there? Well, the question still remains whether or not Ray, whether or not he was at the scene at the time Jody died. And clearly, like I said, he didn't leave DNA, but that doesn't mean he could not have been there. Even without a DNA match, the Constantine Police Department still suspects that Ray is somehow involved in the murder of Jody Parrott and they suspend him from his job as a reserve officer. But those who know Ray best believe he's innocent. Ray McCann is, he, he loves God, he loves Jesus. He has a big flirt with women, I'm gonna tell you that, he loves women. <laughs> um, but I've never known him to be a bad man. I would never even imagine him hurting a little girl. Julie McCann is Ray's sister-in-law. We're all scared. There's someone in our community that killed a child. A child that everybody loved and knew. But I truly never really thought that Ray could have ever done this. Others in Constantine are just as stunned. When did you learn that one of your own, a reserve officer with the Constantine Police Department, 
was a person of interest. And how did you react to that news? It was a big shock to me because he, he lived right next door. He was my neighbor. Ray McCann? Yes. Was your neighbor at the time? Yes. Yep. And I knew Ray very well. I knew his father very well. Yes. And uh, that was really disbelief because I know Ray would come to my, he would help me mow my yard. He would help me shovel my drive. Ray was a terrific neighbor. He really was. And that was, I, I just couldn't. Could you believe it? No, no. With no hard evidence, officers are unable to charge Ray McCann with Jody's murder. But as the case drags on, Ray discovers his days of freedom are numbered. It's been three years since the body of 11-year-old Jody Parrock was found in a cemetery near her home in Constantine. Jody Parrock, a little girl who was murdered here in Constantine, still no suspect. The killer may still be close by. It's 2011, more than three years after Jody Parrock was killed in Constantine, Michigan. The tragedy still looms like a dark cloud over the once tight-knit community while the case remains unsolved. There's no hard evidence tying Ray McCann to Jody's murder. And although he is continuously questioned by police, he's still a free man. With no arrest, Jody's mom, Joe, is struggling to cope. Days, months, months turn into years after your daughter's murder. How could you move on with your life? Were you able to move on with your life, I guess, is the better question. I was suicidal for the first three years. I didn't want to live without her. I felt like I had nothing left to live for. She was my baby. And I felt like a lot of people were blaming me for it. Did you carry a sense of guilt? Yeah, I did, because I shouldn't have let her go to her friend's house that day. Determined to get justice for Jody once and for all, a cold case team takes over in late 2011. The new investigators start back at square one, hoping to uncover clues that might have been missed. But their efforts quickly lead them right back to Ray McCann. On the team is Michigan State Police Detective Shane Krieger. When you opened up this case file four years or so after Jody Perrick was killed, one of the things you knew is that you did not have a DNA match with anyone. Correct. Ray's DNA had been tested. Yes. And it was not a match. Correct. Why was Ray continually questioned then? He continued to make statements that were contradictory to what either we knew or what other people had said. He was a very viable suspect, however, his DNA just didn't match our suspect profile. Well, you felt he knew something. Yeah. In a series of recorded interviews, the investigators confront Ray with their suspicions, and they tell him they have the evidence to prove he was involved in Jody's murder. We know scientifically that you touched her body. You did. Oh, God, Brian, no, I did not. No, I did not. This case has already been reviewed by the prosecutor's office. But here's the thing. Investigators don't actually have any evidence that Ray touched Jody, let alone killed her. They're lying to him in the hopes that the added pressure will lead to a confession. I didn't have nothing to do with those girls. Listen, don't say that, because I don't want to hear it. 
okay? I said, hey, trust me, I know different. So they're, they're going to stick, what, me in jail for something I had no part of? Let me, is that how the system works? Ray denies the allegations against him no less than 86 times during the more than seven hours of recorded interviews. And the cold case investigators are not only lying to Ray about the physical evidence tying him to Jody's murder, they repeat the lies to everyone Ray knows. And now, four years after he first became a suspect, Ray McCann is starting to lose the support of those closest to him. You were called in, interviewed 15 numerous times? times? Numerous times. Mm -hmm. They told me that Jody's body was wet when she was found and that the front forward passenger side of Ray's truck was wet. They had told me that there was sand in Jody's tennis shoes that had come from the play area in the back yard of Ray's house. Um, they had said that they had Ray's DNA um, on Jody. So that's like blowing my mind. Oh my gosh, did they do this? The detective started convincing me. While the people of Constantine and even Ray's own family are turning against him, the cold case team prepares to drop the hammer. Officers place Ray under arrest, not for Jody's murder, but for perjury lying under oath the lie that he went to a parking lot the night of jody's murder to meet up with his partner his partner claims that such a meeting was never arranged ray is sentenced to 20 months in jail for perjury his arrest and sentencing are big news in the local media Raymond McCann has been lying to police every day since November 8th, 2007, when Jody Perrick's body was found right where I'm staying. With Ray McCann in jail, the town of Constantine breathes a sigh of relief. And there's finally a sense that at least some form of justice has been served. But only a few months later, on July 28th, 2015, Relief turns to fear when history nearly repeats itself in the town of White Pigeon, just a few miles from Constantine. The kids were all playing. My husband was in the backyard doing lawn work and I was sitting on the front steps and out of nowhere, I just hear these curdling screaming sounds, and all of a sudden she comes around the corner. And I could tell her shirt is ripped, and she's got this huge glowing scratch. So she comes running up, and she's like, this old man tried to kill me. This old man tried to kill me. Mackenzie had spent the day playing pool at her friend's grandfather's place. As the kids are getting ready to leave, the grandfather asks Mackenzie to stay a bit longer and help him with something in his garage. I'm like, sure, I could come help you with what? And he's like, my tools, I need to um, have them organized. I'm like, Okay, sure. And I walked over there, and he's standing right behind me. I was like, okay, do you want to help? And then he put his hand over my mouth. He had a knife, and he, then there was cords up. He was going to pick, and I kept kicking him and stuff, and then he would not stop. So I kicked him really hard in his stomach. There was a knife? Yes. And he was reaching for cords? Mm-hmm. He almost shut the garage. He was going to shut the garage door so I wouldn't get through it. I was like, there was like this much space. So, and I wow. slid right under it. And then I ran. Why did 
you fight back? There are a lot of young people who are in that same situation don't think to fight back, who are too scared. Right? Well, because I, I just thought I don't want to be dead as a kid early. I didn't want to be murdered or anything. I just want to live my life. When Constantine's police chief, Mark Honeystead, hears what happened in the neighboring town of White Pigeon, he immediately makes the connection between McKenzie's narrow escape and the unsolved case that has haunted him for years. The Jody Parrick murder. In the summer of 2015, Ray McCann is still serving time in jail on perjury charges, and no other arrests have been made in the Jody Parrick murder case. But when a 10-year-old girl named Mackenzie Stafford is attacked and barely escapes with her life, police finally get the break they've been looking for. So this is your evidence room? This is the evidence room. Tell me the first time you heard the name Mackenzie Stafford. Mackenzie had reported to the White Pigeon Police Department uh, about three miles south of here that uh, she'd been attacked by uh, a gentleman in her neighborhood who, who tried to tie her up and threatened her with a knife, but she managed to escape. What part of the story set off red flags for you? Well, there were a number of things. They were age roughly the same as uh, Jody. Same physical build and proximity, of course. At some point, Mackenzie identifies the person who she says attacked her. Yes. Dan Furlong, Daniel Furlong. Was that a familiar name to you? I knew it, not in any criminal context, I knew it because he lived in Constantine at one point. 65-year-old Daniel Furlong, who lived only a few blocks from the police department, was an active and well-liked member of the Constantine community for years. He was even an umpire for Little League softball. This, is, uh, this kit contains the DNA that was collected from Dan Furlong. This is it. Yeah. And you personally took this to the lab. I took that to the crime lab myself. Yeah. You remember the call? You remember getting word? My call came from members of the cold case team who said that we had a match. We had our killer. The chilling words of a child killer. A person of interest until a few months ago. Furlong's arrest on September 10th, 2015 is all over local news. After nearly eight agonizing years, police finally have their man and the DNA match to prove it. In exchange for a plea deal, Furlong agrees to tell the full story of how he killed Jody Perry. His confession is chilling. Ask this girl to come over to help me move some stuff. She got off her bike, came up to the house. That's when I grabbed her, took her in the garage. Her hands were behind her back like this. She said, will you let me go? And I said, I can't let you go. He said that so calmly, so coolly, 
as he's sitting here smoking a cigarette. What should justice look like for a guy who could do something like that? St. Joseph County Prosecutor John McDonough sat witness in the room as Daniel Furlong detailed how he molested and murdered Jody Parrick in his garage in Constantine in 2007. You want to fly out of your seat and do some very nasty things to that person, and it's, it's hard to control your emotions. There are certainly tears running down my face, tears running down officers' faces. It affected us, it affected me for a long time. You know, bringing it up again today is, is, is not easy. Furlong's confession is followed by another horrifying discovery. While going through evidence from his garage, investigators come across a list of names. We were going through some of the scene photographs for the Mackenzie Stafford and we're like, what is that? And on the wall in his garage, he had a list of all the names of the little girls in the trailer park that they were living in. If Daniel Furlong had not been captured, who knows how many other young girls might have become his victim? You know, first and foremost, I wanted justice for Jody Parrick. Um, I wanted to make sure that this man never saw the light of day again. But I also wanted to be able to give her family the story. I wanted to hear the truth from him. At the end of the day, what was Daniel Furlong ultimately sentenced to for the murder of Jody Parrick? The judge sentenced him to 30 to 60 years. That would put him at 95 years old after his minimum sentence. In his confession, Furlong admits to killing Jody alone with no accomplices. In fact, Ray McCann's arrest led Furlong to believe that he had gotten away with murder. You saw everything in the paper about what was going on. What did you think then? I just thought I was in the clear. With the real killer finally in custody, where did that leave Ray McCann, who was still sitting in jail? I want to know, does John McDonough regret prosecuting him? And the final analysis... Ray was truthful about the thing that mattered most. Can we agree on that? That he had nothing to do with Jody Parrick's death. He did not kill her. No, he did not. Why isn't Ray McCann free the moment Daniel Furlong is arrested and sentenced? Because Ray McCann wasn't in prison for murder. He lied to us during a murder investigation of a young child. One of the largest investigations we've had in the history of this county. And to this day, I still think Ray has some information about that night that he hasn't shared. <laughs> talk to Ray McCann now. He was the prime suspect in the murder of Jody Parrick. And I've been talking about Ray in this case all week to his family members, to his friends. I finally get an opportunity to talk to him about it. Give me the moment when it was painfully obvious to you that your life in this town had changed forever? I think the moment I remember, 
I was going to go get my schedule for refereeing football games. And I was told I couldn't referee no more. And I knew life in this town, it would never be the same for me. What made investigator zero in on Ray so quickly? His suggestion that they check the cemetery. In the end, this one detail destroyed his life. Ray still doesn't understand why. I'm from that town. It was, like I said, it was just another place to look, you know, and some reason they just, because I mentioned cemetery and she happened to be found there, you know, started pointing fingers. To this day, even though the man who confessed to Jody's killing is behind bars, investigators still insist Ray had something to do with her murder. The authorities say you're in the position you're in because you lied. I told the truth to the best of my ability. How I believe the night events happened. They had no reason to lie. You know, there was, you know, a dead child. What ultimately landed him in jail was the story he told police about him and his partner agreeing to meet up at a parking lot on the night that Jody died, which his partner denies. Your story is you and your partner had agreed to meet at this particular location. Correct. You go to the location at the agreed upon time. And he's not there. You said you were meeting your partner. Your partner said we never had a conversation. Correct. How do you explain that? It was a pretty busy night, you know. We're all out there searching. I I think, just like me, giving my statements to the best ability, I also think my partner, there's probably things he doesn't remember or things, things that happened. You know, with him giving his statements just like I did, you know, could be wrong on things. He could be wrong on things. There is surveillance video of the area where you're supposed to meet. Correct. The surveillance video doesn't show you being there right. at the time you say you were there to meet your partner it doesn't show anything you can't it's so dark you can't make out anything on the video but it clearly doesn't show you being there right but what you're saying to me it doesn't show you clearly not being there correct even if it's the the angle of the video i, I might have been off to the side a little Ray remains adamant he didn't actually lie. He says his memory of that night simply differs from other people's. But if that's the case, then why would he plead no contest to the perjury charge? Why didn't he fight these accusations in a trial? They came at me and threatened me with life. Life in prison at first. For perjury. For, For lying. Perjury. And then they come back with a plea of one count which was 12 to 20 months. I had a little time to think about it. You know, I'm thinking, I want to go back to my family, and that's going to be the fastest way to do it. But for everyone in this community, what it really means is that you lied. Yeah. And you were going to jail for lying. The price that Ray McCann paid for his alleged untruthfulness was high. In prison, he was beaten by a fellow inmate and suffered a permanent head injury. And when he was finally released in 2015, he had to accept the fact that life as he knew it in Constantine was over. Why did you move out of the community? Too many bad memories. It's like the town turned their backs on me. I had no support from anybody there. And they threw me aside. That's how I felt. But for Ray, the damage to his relationship with his family has been the most devastating. There was a moment in time there when you lost your son. He left me in 2012, went back to his mother's and... I've only seen him three times since. <laughs> it 
You know, I loved him. And they turned him against me. How? Brainwashed him. I don't know all what the police said to him, but they made sure that accusing, you know, accusing me of the murder, they made sure, he, you know, turned him against me. I lost everything. I didn't get to see him graduate. I didn't get to see his last two years of the high school sports and lost everything I had because of this. Still, the people who sent Ray to jail say they have no regrets. In an investigation like this, you can't just let those things go by the wayside. All these inconsistencies, the red flags, the lies, you can't just let it go. They have to be addressed. I feel terrible that the man went to jail. I really, really do. But he put himself there. You know, that's the, the bottom line is he put himself there. He lied. I stand behind everything my office and the police did. Do I have sympathy for Ray McCann? Sure. Was Ray McCann a, a bad guy? Is he a bad guy? No. If given the opportunity when he has the ability to expunge his record, I will certainly um, take that into account and you know, hope that he's able to move on with his life. For Jody Parrick's mother, moving on became a tiny bit easier once her daughter's killer was behind bars. Oh, Joe, that's beautiful. We always have a get-together for her birthday and at night, at 9 o'clock at night, and she would have been 20 this year, so we sent up 20 Sky Lanterns. We set up send up sky lanterns to her on her birthday so many lives were destroyed by this tragedy joe will never see her daughter again and ray has a long road ahead of him rebuilding his life as for the town of constantine a strong sense of community was forever fractured by the events of november 8th 2007 bonds of trust once broken never repaired this was a case that tore apart not only the constantine community but our entire county um, being a lifelong resident of here this these things don't happen here it wasn't some transient person that was just passing through that did this it was a member of our community nobody even knows anybody anymore there's a lot of distance with people. This guy lived right down the road. Who can you trust anymore?